and welcome to this episode of The Agronomist. I am your host, Lindsay Smith, and we are in for a treat. I just realized something, everyone. It is still light out while we're doing this. It's 8 p.m. my time. Um, this is pretty darn exciting. Uh, shout out to, of course, everyone who's already here in the comments saying hello. Um, and Ray DeBanco says, uh, did Sean's birthday celebrations cause a delay? No, because they're next week, Ray. You're a week ahead. It is Sean's birthday next week. And speaking of next week, uh, we are going to be talking about starter fertilizer considerations. So make sure you tune in next week at 8 p.m. Eastern uh, here on The Agronomist. Okay, I did want to, before I get into tonight's show, uh, we've got some wonderful guests joining us here, and I'm very excited. We've got tons of fabulous pictures um, of friends and foes in the field, and I'm super stoked about it. But remember, uh, for joining us tonight, you do qualify for CEU credits if those are something you collect. So head on over to realagriculture.com slash agronomist tomorrow morning uh, and let us know that you watched the episode. Um, now, tonight is that we are talking about early season pests, but we're also talking about beneficials, um, some of the pests and predators, if you will, that are out there, which brings us to tonight's show sponsors. All right, so huge thank you to, of course, Real Ag Radio and to Adama Canada, but also the Pests and Predators podcast. So if you haven't checked this out yet, uh, Pests and Predators goes up every two weeks, uh, usually on the Tuesday. And last week, actually, one of tonight's guests was um, the guest on that and uh, to talk about making sure that you're making the correct identif identification of pests in the field. And also, of course, Adama Canada, while other sources of innovation run dry, Adama is here to deliver, leveraging the world's largest library of actives to provide innovative crop protection solutions to your greatest challenges. We're all in on you. Talk to your Adama sales rep today. So yes, if tonight is one of those ones that you are like, I need to hear more about this, which it probably is, um, then head on over to the Pests and Predators podcast. You can find that at Real Agriculture, um, or you can, uh, of course, you can subscribe, or you can download it uh, wherever you get your podcasts. All right. Okay. So we do have a bit of a delay of one of our guests joining us, but you know what? We're going to bring in, uh, we'll just bring him in on the fly. But uh, tonight, get that? Did you see that? Did you hear it? On the fly? Okay. <laughs> Tonight, I do have John Kowalski with Manitoba Agriculture, who will be here momentarily, and Scott Mears with Mayland Consulting. And Scott, oh, well, oh, there, there we, we go. Yeah. Welcome, Scott. How are you? I'm doing good. Yeah, real that's, good. That's good. Okay, so while we wait for John, John had a few technical difficulties, so we're going to just keep rolling and keep trying. Um, but we did, just before the show started, we were chatting about carrots, um, of all things. But Scott, many, many people will, of course, recognize you from uh, your days back with Alberta Agriculture. But what is keeping you busy these days? So I'm doing a little bit of consulting here and there. I have, uh, I have a small handful of clients. So I'm, I'm consulting with a, a, a market garden group out of Innisfail, so Innisfail growers. And one of them is a carrot grower. So we're talking about what I'm doing in carrots. So <laughs> and then I am also doing some broad acre and um, I just signed up a hemp grower. So I have just this crazy, mm -hmm. crazy sort of do whatever it's, sort of thing going on. It's an yeah. interesting portfolio you have. So is is the fruit and vegetable side of things exciting? Did you have to like suddenly go back and research a whole bunch of stuff? Well, it's, it's funny because my undergrad, actually, I took horticulture. So oh. it's kind of going back to <laughs> what I originally studied. So actually, the Innisfail group actually approached me when they heard I was retiring and said, you need to come talk to us. And, and mm -hmm. so I, I work with a strawberry grower, and I also work with the carrot and uh, coal crop. So, and, and I also work with the fresh pea and asparagus grower. So, so, so I my... was studying early season insects yes. in asparagus today. So Today? Yeah. Yeah, see, hey, from yeah. the field. All right, John Gavlowski here with Manitoba Agriculture. John, can we hear you? Uh, I hope so. Yes, yes. we can. <laughs> and there you he can is. hear us. Yay. Okay, this is live. This is what happens. All right, John, uh, you are, of course, based uh, near Carmen, Manitoba. Do you have bare ground yet, or is it still underwater and or snow? 
Oh boy, a combination of everything, really. The, the oh, snow's goodness. mainly gone. There's a little bit of snow in the, um, the uh, shelter belts and covered areas, but for the most part, the snow's gone. But we've got another inch or so of rain today. A lot of water's underground. Um, oh. It's going to be a while before people are seeding. There's been a little bit of seeding in the southwest that I'm aware of, but really not much seeding, and it's going to be another week or so with this recent rain. Now, so that, of course, makes me think, you know, our, we're already May 9th, so that feels like a bit late already to still be waiting for things to dry out. So the first thing sort of, of course, is field conditions and soil conditions when you're trying to seed, but if conditions stay, well, more than moist potentially for parts of Manitoba, um, what are the insect pests that really like moisture? Or do they not like moisture? The, uh, well, the tricky part is some like the moisture, some don't like the moisture. And even within a given group of insects, uh, it, it varies. So um, ones that do like it to some degree, things like root maggots, um, uh, some of the midge flies, um, sunflower midge, and even wheat midge to some degree, they need some moisture to um, get their development going, although too much might um, uh, offset them a little bit. So we, we really wanna pay attention to some of those. Now, the, the big question a lot of people are wondering is what about grasshoppers? Because- yes, that was my next know, question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a lot of people um, have been asking me about that. Uh, does, does this mean no grasshoppers? And the unfortunate answer is, if we had the, this rain and, and these uh, field conditions, you know, flooding conditions, about three weeks from now, it could really knock their populations back. But right now, it probably won't do much. And the reason is right now, our pest species are still all in the egg stage. And that egg stage is very resilient to excess moisture. Uh, a colleague of mine uh, told me he once took uh, grasshopper egg pods, put them in a glass of water for a week, the water out, the eggs hatched. So mm. um, the, the, the flooded ditches and fields right now, unfortunately, won't likely mean uh, less grasshoppers. Now, like again, if we had the same conditions in about three weeks, late May, first couple of weeks in June, it can really knock a population back. But at this point, that sounds like a nightmare for everyone in Manitoba who is dealing with too much moisture. And what a, a turn of events from last year being so dry. So, yeah. Now, Scott, different, uh, you're, you're, of course, you're in Alberta, different uh, conditions entirely. But tell us where you are in the province, where you're working mostly. Are you dealing with extreme dryness right now or is it not so bad? Yeah, so I... I uh deal with uh, broad acre clients out in the MD of Acadia and the special areas. And they are dry, uh, not so dry that uh, the seed that went in two and a half, three weeks ago isn't germinating, but it's dry and they, these crops will run out in, in very mm -hmm. short order. So the big rain on the weekend, um, I think I, uh, one client said they got two tenths. So, and that was really the big rain that was the big rain and they are getting a little desperate. Uh, it's not, mm -hmm. it's not critical yet, but we haven't lost crops yet, but boy, yes. it, it doesn't look very good. So mm -hmm. um, yeah. And just the complete opposite of John, um, my clients out in that area are both in excess of 80% seeded. So they, they will finish wow. this week if it stays dry. So mm -hmm. Yeah. And that certainly seems to be, you know, quite common for Southern Alberta and those sorts of things of hearing really that, you know, farmers have been rolling for a while already, just with the hope mm -hmm. of the rain will begin again and the crop will be there to take in that moisture when it comes. So mm -hmm. uh, we'll keep trying and uh, uh, and we'll see how it plays out. Now, so good. that does... We have to get John to share some of that moisture. Yeah, it's... exactly. Yeah. Stop hugging it, John. Yeah. yeah. Now, he would be happy, question... I'm sure. 
(laughs) (laughs) My question to you, though, Scott, and this does often come up with, um, you know, because uh, Peter Johnson will also push, you know, especially for cereals, you know, get them in early. They're just going into dry storage when it's dry and cool, let's say. Um, And we are talking about dry conditions. But I, I would imagine insect feeding may still happen on those seeds potentially. Are there any pests that we are worried about or are those seeds pretty safe? They're pretty safe from insect pests um, unless they start to germinate and then things like uh, wireworms will, will zone in on them. When, they, when they're in dry storage, they're in dry storage and it, um, it takes a germinating seed uh, to give off a CO2 signature to attract uh, things like wireworms. So yeah, they're, they're safe, dry. Um, they're not, the farmer's not happy, dry, no, <laughs> but the exactly. seed is, the seed is okay. Um, the, the problem, some of the problems would probably more center around just dry enough to get them started germinate or wet enough right. to start them germinating and then drying out. That would be, right. you know, but that's not an insect thing. So yeah. yeah. That's that's just all bad all around. Okay, but let's yeah. start there with wireworm. And of course, as always, anyone who's following along tonight, uh, if you have any questions for our guests, just hop on the chat. Uh, we're likely going to talk about wireworm, flea beetle, cutworm, um, but really all sorts of other things that may come up. But we are going to talk about some of those beneficial insects that are out there as well. And John, um, key point on the Pest and Predators podcast that you made last week was correctly identifying what you're looking at so that you can make the best management decision. So, and you've sent along some pictures. There's some confusion at times over, let's start with wireworm. Um, so producer Jay, I think we've got a couple pictures. If you can maybe bring some of those up. John, what do people commonly confuse with wireworm? Probably the most common one that I get is something called um, therivid or stiletto fly larva, mm-hmm. which are quite pale, white. They thrash around a lot. Um, so they're, they're different than a wireworm in, in several ways. Uh, centipedes are another one. I've had people bring in samples of centipedes wondering if they were wireworms. Um, okay. There is another potential pest called seed corn maggot, um, much smaller than wireworms. Uh, the usually a little bit less significant in what they do, but they can be a economic concern. And even things like um, some of the uh, white grubs and things when they're right. small, people mm-hmm. might confuse. But probably the so- stiletto fly larva and centipedes are big too. Okay, so this is wireworm, right, that we're looking at right now? That is wireworm. Now, that is one of our prairie species here. That's called Hypnotis bicolor. And my apologies for the Latin names. There's no common name for this one. Uh, It's actually the most common of our prairie species. It is one of the uh, pest wireworms, I'll call it. Uh, It's a smaller species. It only gets to 10, 12 millimeters. Uh, there's another species that the prairie grain wireworm that is more of an or- yellowish orange than this one. This one's a very light, uh, almost pale yellow. So there we go. So mm-hmm. uh, prairie grain wireworm, more of an orangey species, a bit bigger. They will get to almost an inch, uh, about 23, 24 millimeters. So wireworms can um, vary. So just to, uh, I guess, uh, cover a few things about wireworms. They're a big group. So they're, they're a group of beetles, uh, Elateridae the group. There's 385 species of them in Canada. And there's about 30 that we consider to be potential pests. And there's a, a couple in the prairies that are quite common. They're a beetle larva. So if, now it's hard to see in this picture, but in the previous one, uh, if, if we can go back to that, Lindsay, yep. um, you will notice up near the head, there's three really small pairs of legs. So in the, in the top beetle larva right. on the top one here. Top yes, left. The top one. Yes. Yeah. The top yeah. You can see it. That's great. The bottom one you can't really see the head end too well. But on the top one, you, you can see those three little pair of legs. Um, and they usually have a little what looks like a notch near the back of the body as well. So those are a couple key things. Okay. Whereas some Did of the really... things people confuse them with 
Yeah. So, John, can I really? So, centipedes? Really? They seem distinctly different. Like, that one seems like people should know better. But, all right. Maybe I'm just overestimating how much people pay attention. Right? That's, that doesn't look like a wireworm. Yeah. It's it's <laughs> yellowy orange. But uh, I've had people bring in samples and say, yeah. are these wireworms? And, and this was a, a farming family that, um, I mean, they're, they, uh, they're good farmers. And I think they just want to make sure. Right. You can see there's there's way too many legs. Um, yes. Centipedes are quick. And they've got the big antenna at the front. Um, but they're another group that there's different species and appearance can vary. Sometimes they're very much wireworm-like in color. But like I said, there are a few differences. All right. Now, Lara, Lara de Mosak says, does anyone else wonder if the movie Tremors is even remotely accurate? great movie it still holds up i'll have you know um all right now so so scott um scott wireworm is essentially i mean it's an issue across the prairies um yeah. are you seeing seeing more of it than before has it become yes. an increasing pest in alberta it's it's not exclusively but mostly a southern alberta problem and we do have the two species that john talked about the prairie grain wireworm tends to be more in the drier parts of southern Alberta. Um, along the foothills, we have Limonius. Um, what the heck is the last? Any is so Limonius you could, the genus? You could make um, up, Scott, and we yeah. won't know. <laughs> it's, it's, well, it's, John might, but I won't. I, yeah, I just blanked out on it. I, I was just reading yeah, it. Limonius right. that we're thinking of. Californicus, there. yeah. So it oh, is. Um, it is also called the sugar beet warworm, but we're finding along the foothills and in irrigation and we mm -hmm. do get hypnoides bicolor as well and there are some fields where it's quite severe so those are the mm -hmm. three main ones but really it all all the major wireworm problems are in southern alberta and some extremely severe problems in southern alberta right yeah and we we have heard reports even last week of of farmers and agronomists finding damage and finding wireworm uh, yes. right now. So, um, so certainly one to, uh, to keep on the lookout for. Now we have this show, it goes every Monday night and just by the nature of how things are, we have been quite focused on Ontario. Um, but this show will largely focus on the West, but that's okay. Some of these pests also happen on Ontario. So bring on challenge these guests if you'd like, but we, of course, we cannot talk early season pests with without talking about flea beetle um and we're probably going to talk a lot about flea beetle but we're going to take a, a, a quick look at um a clip from a canola school episode with autumn barnes because she makes a key point about even if you don't see the pest uh it's not the pest you're looking for it's the damage that they do so i want to use this as a leaping off point for our next discussion so jay could you run that clip with autumn So um, today is May 23rd. This uh, this field was seeded on May 5th. So the crop's just starting to come up. It's about cotyledon stage. And we're going to take a look through it and, and see what we can find for flea beetles. So what we're going to be looking for um, is little pockmarks on the cotyledons and if there's any true leaves uh, on those. We'll also be looking at the stems and underneath the cotyledons um, because that is an area where they can feed. And, and it has been a little bit cool here the past week or so. And so... Um, in cooler weather, flea beetles, because they're cold-blooded, their muscles don't really work as well in the cold. And so they'll tend to kind of fall onto the soil or hide in cracks. And sometimes they'll feed actually underground, crazily enough, um, but on the, on the stems and the undersides of the leaves when it's a little bit cooler. So we'll make sure to check there. Today it's a beautiful warm sunny day, so we might see some flea beetles hopping around um, or feeding on leaves. But... It's really important when we're when we're scouting for flea beetles and we're assessing damage that we don't we don't use the presence or absence of the beetle itself as a, as a way to decide if we're in trouble or not. What we're looking for is the damage. And if that little canola plant is growing actively and is going to be able to grow past that damage. Um, and so if it looks like the canola plants are really suffering, if we have more than 25% damage and it looks like um, they're just, you know, we're still at a cotyledon stage and, and, this, and a field or maybe a part of the field like the headlands, 
is um, is really infested with them. Um, not seeing them is not necessarily going to mean we don't spray because they can be hard to find. And, you know, I said it's warm. There's a bit of a breeze picking up and flea beetles actually don't really like the wind. They're a tiny little insect. They can get blown around by it. Um, so, so if it's windy and generally windier than today because it's not that windy, but if it is windy, then that's another reason you might not find them. Can you tell me a bit about what damage actually looks like on the cotyledons? Sure. So usually it looks like a little pockmark, kind of like a divot on a golf ball. Um, and and so they can take, they take little bites because they're tiny little beetles, right? They take little bites. And if, if there's a lot of them feeding really voraciously, then the pockmarks will get big. Um, sometimes the pockmarks will kind of dry out and turn brown. Um, but if they're fresh bites, they'll kind of sometimes be a bit of a darker green. And fun fact that I just learned about flea beetles recently is when they when they chew on canola, um, the canola produces a compound, basically um, kind of like a, a stress thing. You know, it gets chewed on, and because flea beetles are um, they're they're specific predators, right? Like they're 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 um, they're specialist predators, right? They want to feed on canola and brassicas, so they can actually sense that, and they'll come more. So if you have a bunch of cano- a bunch of flea beetles that are emerging from, um, you know, maybe a tree line or something where they've overwintered, and then there's um, there's some can- uh, some canola there, and and flea beetles are feeding on it, they'll actually realize that there's some good food there being eaten, and they'll they'll cluster to it. So that's why we'll actually sometimes see. Um, you know, flea beetles with a lot more pressure on the headlands or kind of near tree lines and things like that because they're coming out of where they've overwintered and then they they kind of all come to the party, I guess, to start eating. So. And do you usually see them throughout the year or do you only see them at springtime? Yeah, so the good, good question. So they overwinter, they come out as, so they overwinter as adults. They, they come out of where they've overwintered. They feed generally around middle to end of June is when they die. Um, those adults start to die. And then at the end of the summer, the next generation starts feeding as well. So um, thank you, Ray, for noticing that I got to a clip. High five me. But also, I'm going to challenge autumn on this idea that windy conditions deter flea beetles because then how would southern alberta have any (laughs) so that just (laughs) all i hear from from anyone who lives in southern alberta is the wind um so there we go okay so let's talk flea beetles john i'll start with you very quickly are there things that we mistake for flea beetles because that one seems like one of the ones we really need to have our head wrapped around so do we know what flea beetles look like 100% of the time? In most cases, I think people are pretty comfortable with what a flea beetle is. There are things that you can confuse. Now, one that can be common in fields in the spring is a very small ground beetle called bambidian. It's a tiny black ground beetle. And uh, sometimes you will see a lot of them running around on the ground. Now, they don't jump like a flea beetle. Right. And uh, shape-wise, they're a little different. But that's the only one I can think of that a person would likely confuse. But the thing is with Bambidian, they are on the soil where they blend in well, not on the plants. They do like to take cover. But if you're poking around, disturbing the soil, you will see them moving around sometimes. And they're a predator, by the way. They, they're they a good guy. They like eating insect eggs and small insects, right. so you want them. But that's really the only one I can think of that you might confuse a flea beetle with. Okay. All right, and Scott, um, obviously lots of experience with flea beetles. Mm. Is the stem feeding, how do we, or let's put that a different way. We sort of know the rule of thumb, 25% feeding damage. Uh, we probably need to take action because by the time you get to 50%, we're in trouble. Right. How do we gauge stem feeding? So stem feeding is is really tough, and um, it it seems to be more related, but not exclusive to to the striped flea beetle. And okay. um, I think we see more stem feeding by uh, striped flea beetle because it's it's early more it's active earlier in the season. Okay. So. We're more prone in the early season to get those cold days uh, where the flea beetles are forced down on the plant to shelter. And um, we, we sometimes see 
a very extreme damage from from stem feeding and to me it becomes more about what's your plant stand and are you right. are you getting to critical levels on your plant stand and if you start losing plants from stem feeding then your tolerance for uh, stem feeding from in a poor plant stand drops down so that's the way i've always talked to farmers about about stem feeding is you can you can withstand some stem feeding if your plant stands are strong but if you're weak if you're already falling below that six plants per square foot which is kind of uh where we start to lose yield um mm -hmm. and you're getting stem feeding then I, I think that we need to be uh fairly aggressive on flea beetle mm -hmm. stem feeding so that's that's the way so, i've always talked about it yeah and and one of the key parts here of course is flea beetles are i mean they they damage the cotyledons they do the stem feeding of a very tiny little plant but so one key point scott that i'm glad you hit on was of course plant stand counts so we need to be cognizant of what else this this plant stand is up against as well but how important is active growth at that time when you're making that call do you do you spray or not spray how do you work in sort of crop yeah. conditions and growing conditions because that's a well, big one we tend to get stem feeding when the crop's not growing well so that's that's the double whammy right there is they go down like flea beetles really like feeding on those little cotyledons and the, uh, we don't really see stem feeding in good conditions they tend to mm -hmm. they tend to move up on the plant on good conditions so we're not I, i've never really seen extensive if we've had a run of good weather um we don't seem to get much stem feeding if we've had a run of good weather and the canola's up cotyledon stage and then we get like this morning which was you know sleet and yes. snow in yes, calgary and mm -hmm. um then where do the flea beetles go they go hunker down and and yeah, yeah. um then you start losing plants so um yeah i i don't think it's i don't we don't tend to get I, I haven't really seen it where we we get stem feeding in good growing conditions so okay yeah. um now so john so next question but i'll, I'll preface it with this so, so we autumn did say of course where the adults emerge in the early spring uh, they feed they die off now i have been in a field late uh late in the season and it is covered in flea beetles so mm -hmm. scott gillespie shares the next generation so that fall generation loves tilled radish radish planted in early august which makes sense um in the radish family um but should we worry about what fall numbers look like are they indicative of of what we can expect the next year or how much does that fall you know they're everywhere should we be panicking or do we just ignore what happens in the fall People have tried researching that and it's not clear cut. Um, sometimes the fall levels seem to line up quite nicely with the spring, other times they didn't. So the, the, the research, the, the reason we don't have a good, say, forecast map for you is the, 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 the studies that have been done had a lot of variability in them. So. Um, use that guideline with caution. I always suggest that uh, if you do have a lot in the fall, uh, be prepared for flea beetles in the spring, but there is no guarantee, of course. So right. uh, use that as a guideline. Um, now, that being said, we've had chronically high levels for yeah. several years. So going into this year, I've been telling growers, expect it. But really in the springtime, the amount of damage you get, which is what Autumn was keying in on, uh, flea beetles are only one part of that equation. The other part is how well those plants are, are growing. In mm -hmm. Manitoba, we might, I'm going to predict we might see less damage this year than the last couple of years, because what happened last year, we were in the situation Scott was in, where people were seeding into really dry ground. It took a long time for the plants to come up, and then when they did, we got some cool weather and they sat in the vulnerable seedling stage for weeks. Uh -huh. So heavy damage. Yeah, yeah. Now this year, people are going to be seeding their canola quite late into hopefully good soil moisture, possibly yeah. some warmer conditions. If we get that really rapid germination and rapid growth through that seedling stage, 
we may see a lot less foliar spraying than we did the past couple of years. Mm -hmm. I certainly um, have heard of, even with a seed treatment, of course, uh, spray being uh, required um, and reseeding, unfortunately, has happened when they come in fast and furious and, and you can't get ahead of them. Um, shout out to Warren Schneckenberger, who's actually planting here in Ontario. So high five, Warren. Um, Warren managed all last fall season to make the agronomist on Monday nights because he was not harvesting. It was not a great harvest season no, for Warren. That's not happy. So, no. yeah, so it was not a good reason. So I'm no, glad it's... that, uh, yeah, you're getting in the field, Warren. That's awesome. All right, Jason's got a great question about uh, crucifer versus striped flea beetle. Uh, so we'll tackle that one. And then I have one more question um, at least. But Jason says, no, Jason said, I'm going to about how much does the spring weather condition uh, or how much do spring weather conditions dictate whether we see more crucifer versus striped flea beetles? John, I'll go to you. Um, as J Jason is out of Manitoba, but Scott, by all means, uh, follow up if you'd like. So I think what you'll notice this year, normally in our normal situation in Manitoba, late April, early May, it's mainly striped. And then we get the crucifer coming out. And by late May, it's usually um, the crucifer is becoming more dominant, at least in the southern part of the province. And, but, and as we go into June, they're by far the dominant species. Now, when we go into northern Manitoba, a bit more striped flea beetles up there. I think what we'll see this year, uh, because we've had a very cool April, uh, we probably will still see striped being the dominant species when we do start noticing them. But by the time the canola is seeded and up out of the ground, I'm almost expecting uh, it'll be a, a real mix of species. I don't know well, get know both. Yeah. that dominant striped population early that we we do on the seedlings i think it'll be a real mix and maybe even do, more dominantly crucifer in manitoba mm -hmm. this year okay scott yeah i i think i pretty much agree with john except for our timing would be a little bit later so it'd be early april mm -hmm. uh, uh striped and then by or, or early may striped and by mid-may we're seeing uh crucifer that said uh, everything north of Red Deer is almost exclusively striped snow, so striped flea beetle. And southern Alberta is mostly crucifer, although we're seeing more striped now, even down into the Vulcan area in southern Alberta. So, um, yeah, it's it's very similar, just the timing would be later. Um, I would One other thing on the, on the fall flea beetles, I've only ever seen accumulations of, of crucifer flea beetle. I've never seen accumulations of stripe. And if John's seen mm. them, that'd be interesting. But I interesting. only see stripe flea beetle deep down in the canopy where crucifer in the, in the, in towards fall, where crucifer tends to be up on the pods more. So I don't, John, have you seen that? Or is that just no, a you're crazy? Right. Uh, it's, it's the same observation we've had here. Uh, and we've seen some very significant populations in August in particular, uh, wow. to the point where people are spraying their uh, canola. But you're right, it's mainly uh, crucifer that we're seeing. I think their behavior late in the season as they're um, feeding, getting ready for winter is very different between the two species. Something I, that really has been studied greatly, but um, observationally, yes, it seems to be dominantly crucifer that we see on the pods anyway. Uh, right. late in mm -hmm. the, the strikes are there, but they're just not visible up on the pods. Yeah, they seem to be down feeding on the stems of the canola or something because they're not on the pods. But anyway, yeah, it's different. This brings up so many questions for me. But Ray actually interjects, um, is one species worse than the other? Hmm. And is it because of the species or is it because it's earlier or later? Mm -hmm. huh. You want me to jump what? in, John? <laughs> Go for it. Yeah. All we, right. we've, yeah. In Alberta, we, we've had more trouble managing a striped flea beetle than crucifer okay. and it it may be that by the time we're getting our stripes the crops are growing better uh, and it may mm -hmm. be where where they're coming out um like the stripes being more in in central alberta where the crops are more affected usually by cooler weather in the spring so it, right. it, it i don't know why but i we have more trouble managing striped flea beetle than than uh crucifer Okay, yeah, and John? Another thing that we might want to factor in too is uh, that the seed treatments that people are using may mostly belong to a group called the neonicotinoids. Right. And 
there's been some yeah. research at University of Alberta that showed that the neonicotinoids uh, work better on the crucifers than they do the stripes. It's not that they don't work on the stripes. There's no resistance. But, I mean, flea beetles are a fairly large group of insects, and the, the seed treatments don't work equally well on all species. And it just right. so happens that they work better on crucifer a bit uh, less well, I'll say. It's not that they're not working, but they're just not working as well on the stripes. So they don't okay. get killed much and they, they will do more feeding. Mm -hmm. I just want to throw one crazy thing into the, the mix is I was scouting uh, early seeded spinach this this week and or this this morning and I was finding hot flea beetle on on cruise on, on spinach. So it's a third Ooh. species that is sometimes found in canola, but is not really a major issue in canola. And it's not a major issue here, but it's just weird to find another flea beetle. And, and it, it seemed to really like, like the, uh, the spinach, not enough of them to get wild about, but it's there. And so. sorry, it's a hop flea beetle. Is that what you call yeah, it? It's like called hop hops the plant or yeah. because it hops. No. I like to know. <laughs> it's, it's, it's named after. <laughs> Go it ahead, likes John. The hops as well. It likes but hops. Okay. Just to follow up on what Scott is saying, flea beetles are a relatively large group, as I mentioned. Yeah. Uh, we've mm -hmm. got over 70 species in Manitoba. And aside from the ones on canola, we do have one called the red headed flea beetle that we sometimes right. see a bit of on soybeans and things. But there's also yes. beneficial flea beetles. Flea beetles get a bad name because of the couple that feed on right. canola primarily. But uh, Gradmus might not like us doing this, but uh, we've done releases of flea beetles in Manitoba. But these are species that eat nothing but leafy spurge. So oh, very diet. They're beneficials. Yeah. And yeah. they're part of the biological control program for leafy spurge. There's three species yeah. that have been released and, and spread around. And it, um, it's been done in Alberta, Saskatchewan, uh, a lot of US states. It's a primary way of managing leafy spurge. So uh, when we say flea beetle, everyone oh. thinks of course, the ones in canola, but we do have right. flea beetles as well. So there Nicely you go. So, yeah, yes, there great. you go. I had <laughs> no idea. That's what, that's what is, I had heard there was an insect that ate leafy spurge beyond goats, which are like a large one. Um, but I didn't know it was a flea beetle. Now, uh, Jason wants to clarify, is there one of the two species that prefers cool and wet and one hot and dry, or is it just early versus late? It's more early versus late. I think they both like it warm and dry. John, okay. you can jump in, but. Yeah, I always uh, uh, try to enforce in the growers that three beetle, flea beetles like three things. They like relatively hot conditions. Um, they like it dry and they like it calm. So those are the days when you really have to be scouting carefully, especially if you're past three weeks from seeding date. If it's right. into the 20s, um and it's relatively calm and it's not rainy or too humid those are the days they're going to feed most aggressively whether it's striped or crucifer okay uh lara points out because i i wondered if lara would hop on here so hello and thank you uh she actually worked with hops and not even when she worked with them did she see a hop flea beetle so scott huh. you're a blessed man and huh. ray debanko stole my joke because if they were feeding on spinach those are popeye flea beetles okay ray I don't know if I should be scared or really chuffed that we have the same joke. Um, okay, so <laughs> I'll let you decide that, right? Uh, all right, we we only have about 15 minutes left, and uh, that's not a lot of time because we haven't yet cut, talked about cutworms. So, right. and, and we need to, because this is one of those ones where I, okay, first of all, they're gross. I mean, not as gross as white grubs but they're gross um but also i mean the damage that they do you know we can find these bare patches and just there's nothing left the plants are gone um mm -hmm. and how do you control something like this so scott maybe I'll, I'll start with you how do you how do you anticipate a cutworm problem boy that's tough uh, there's not really a good uh, forecasting system uh, there are pheromone-based systems, but um, they were done by uh, Dr. Bob Byers way back in, what, the 60s, 70s, maybe? Um, but he could not find correlation between moth catches and, and outbreaks. So so good pheromone systems, uh, but not good 
pro, uh, um, not good predictions. So um, there are some, some, I guess, factors that lead to potential problems. Um, we, we see some species really like green material in the fall, but not all species. Some species, then, then there are, there's a really excellent book out or uh, publication out by Egg Canada on, on cutworms. And anybody that's in the field should actually download this and have it in their back pocket because there's a number of different species and uh, it's it really does help. So um, I was scouting asparagus this morning or this afternoon and we were finding cutworm damage in asparagus. So that's that's an overwintering species. So it's probably like an army army cutworm of some sort. So um, we haven't found the actual cutworm yet this year. Um, last year we found redback and army cutworm in. We had to spray the asparagus because it was it was causing significant damage. People don't like half-eaten asparagus for some reason. I don't know why. Weird. But... Weird, right? <laughs> yeah, previously, weird. previously enjoyed asparagus. Um, yeah. Okay, so so John, let's let's maybe add to that cutworm being, you know, one of those ones exactly that that can cause some serious damage. Um, do we have decent control options though because i mean it it they're hard to find like scott even said yeah you know it's a complicated question because when we're talking about cutworms we're not talking about one species we're talking about a complex of species mm -hmm. and some species uh spend a lot of their time in the evening above ground feeding uh either on the the leaves or the stems and for those species uh insecticides will work better We've got other species such as pale western cutworm and glassy cutworm that really don't come above the ground much and insecticides just don't work well on those. Um, so it, it depends on the species to some degree and even the amount of damage they're going to do can vary greatly mm -hmm. between species. Um, some like redback cutworm, uh, uh, once they get to be larger larvae, they will cut a lot of stems. When they're doing their feeding, they will clip the plants and you see plants lying on the ground. And then there's others like dingy cutworm that really don't do a lot of clipping. They will come and just kind of chomp on the leaves and do a lot mm -hmm. more defoliation, but not necessarily um, clipping the plant. So uh, what are we looking at here? So that one is your dingy cutworm. And as a, it's a good name. Uh, yes, and as an identifying <laughs> feature, uh, they've got this light uh, white line down the middle. On either side of that, there's what look like little V's going down along that mm. line. It almost looks like tire tracks down the back. So that's one of the distinguishing features. So that's uh, an example of what we call a climbing cutworm. So they will climb on the plants. They will chomp on the cotyledons or leaves. Don't do a lot of clipping. It makes it really tricky for crop scouts, though, because a lot of times people, when they see the cut plants, they make the association, it's cutworms. With dingy, you don't see the cut plants. You just see the foliation. And if you're scouting during the day, there's no insects there above right. ground. They're all below ground. And uh, I know people have uh, that have been quite confused by dingy because they're seeing the foliation, but no insects. The plants aren't cut. I usually tell them to start digging, dig around those plants right. and see what you find. So quick question, because that was, I guess, I was going to say, all right, so can we dig these up? So how far under the soil surface would you typically find, let's say, dingy cutworm? Or does it depend on temperature? It depends on soil moisture more than anything and the stage of right. the cutworm. When they're really small, it's usually five to ten centimeters down that range when they're really small, especially if the soil moisture is good. When they get to be older caterpillars, they will go deeper into the soil potentially, especially if it's dry. If it's dry soil, they'll go as deep as eight to 10 centimeters down. Um, so yeah, it depends on those two factors really, the, the stage and the soil moisture. A couple, okay. couple tips that I talk to agronomists about uh, and farmers is, if, it's, if you have a dry surface, often you find cutworms at that dry, wet interface. So mm. uh, they're often down to, but not in the wet. If it's really wet, you'll often find them just hiding under clumps of, of residue. Uh, mm. So they can, they can get a, 
you know, it's kind of a drier spot, I guess, you know, rather than sitting down in the furrow, they'll be under the residue between the rows. So, cause the furrow kind of plows the residue out of the way. So it really is depending on conditions and each species is going to be a little bit different. So yeah, mm -hmm. it's, it's a really tough one. The other thing I I'm really seeing I'm using now when I'm scouting, cause I have about 20,000 acres of, of broad acre crops to scout. And I actually look at the weekly satellite images before I go into fields. And I always go to the, where, where the crop is not doing as well. And it's surprising how often there's cutworms in that area. So it's, it's just this modern technique and like some of, some of your, some of your, um, your companies now are providing weekly images. And I, I started using them because it, it points out problems. Sometimes it's a seeding problem. Sometimes it's uh, herbicide residues. Sometimes it's a pest issue. So, so uh, it's, it's a really, it's a shortcut and that's an easier way to find that because cutworms are always not, they're, they're always over the hill. They're not right. where you can see them from the road. Right? <laughs> Always. <laughs> That's a, so I I wondered if you were using some sort of imagery because frankly, you're just trying to cover 20,000 acres, but it's a, it's a fantastic sort of heads up of this may be a problem. Go check it out and go see what yeah. it is. Now, producer Jay, we've got a few other images of cutworms that I want to go through and just talk. I think there's, that's the glassy, glassy. right? because it it's glassy looking i see how you entomologists do this now you see i'm just <laughs> i'm putting two and two together um and uh and yeah so what now i've never seen this one before i've seen lots of other different cutworms so uh john where is this one and why haven't i seen it before do i just not dig enough well this one is somewhat of a grassy specialist so they oh like grassy plants. Um, often forage grasses, perennial forage grasses are where we do see them. Sometimes you will see them in wheat, especially if people have been growing wheat on wheat for yeah. a few years or yeah. other serious crops. Uh, rotation may help reduce the odds of them being an issue. But they're also a species that does not come above the ground to feed much. They do right. pretty much all their feeding mm -hmm. below ground. So when they are an issue, they're very hard to deal with. Uh, people have done insecticide trials on them and it, the results are not usually very good. So, uh, yeah, uh, rotate your, your grains. That'll yeah, help yeah. reduce your risk. Yeah. But, yeah. In All Alberta, right, yeah. our, oh, our ahead, major yeah. problems with this pest has been in, in uh, perennial grass stands. So right. we have had a, a couple fields of on wheat on wheat, like John says, but Really, this is this is more a perennial grass stand issue issue for us in Alberta. Okay, so so following up on that, of course, so understanding life cycle, understanding what they eat, live on, um, and John tweaking into something John said as well about um, and you know that green material in the fall. So Manitoba had what they called zombie canola, which was canola that had gone dormant and then started to regrow when the rain came. It actually flowered, some even potted. So Jason's wondering, so as an agronomist, are those fields you should be prioritizing potentially for cutworm scouting? Is there any correlation? Is there any data? John, maybe I'll start with you because it's in Manitoba, but Scott for sure would love to hear your thoughts on if if yeah, we have any correlation. Very good question. Um, there's been a couple studies where they've looked at the emergence and egg laying period of cutworms, specifically red back and uh, dingy and some of our more common species. Most of the emergence and egg laying happens in August. So even if you have a lot of green plant material going way into October, it doesn't mean you've got this extended egg laying period. Now, one thing that could happen again, uh, with emergence and egg laying, like a bell curve, uh, the, the peak is in about mid-August. Some of it's happening in early August, and then you've got some happening in later August, maybe into September. Uh, but usually with most of our pest species, most of that egg laying is probably done once we get well into September. So uh, I, I don't know that you'll see a lot more of the cutworms in um, in, the, in those fields that have that late green growth. Now for some species though, that overwinter is partially grown larva. This is where it gets complicated again. Yeah, some again. 
eggs, others as partially grown larvae. They may be off to a good start, having that green growth to feed on and that later season. Yeah, so in Alberta, we get uh, an army cutworm that searches out green areas in the fall. And when we get an outbreak of that insect, it's always, always in fields that were green in the fall. Now, I don't think that correlated with, like we didn't have a major flight uh, last year because we actually see a flight in June as they're moving this is a crazy species, but they fly to the foothills to go on a summer holiday, basically. Holiday. Yeah, yeah. They, they they go into summer estivation is what it's called. Is a They hide under rocks and stuff. And then they come back out in the fall. So we didn't see that last year. So we're very unlikely to see army cutworm in any numbers. But they mm -hmm. do really like to lay eggs in green material in the fall. Um, but it's not the same with each species. Red back cutworm in Alberta often lays eggs in pulse stubble. Um, Pale Western lays eggs in loose soil. So it's very species specific. So I know it may be probably different in, in uh, Manitoba, John, but that's, that's kind of the trends we're seeing in Alberta. Yeah, I think the big difference is the species difference. We don't see a lot of army cutworm here. It's a little bit too far east. Some years we do see a bit, but um, because of their flight back to the Rockies, we just don't get as many as uh, you mm -hmm. get in Alberta. So that's the, this is the army cutworm here. And, no, uh, this, no? That, this, this one's a black army cutworm. Yes, oh. which is different. Than there's the, a, there's oh, so totally different. Like, yeah, I mean, well, what the heck? Yeah. Come you on, guys. I should have been onto that. It was, it's black, that. so you should have had black right. in the name. Black. Yeah army cutworm got it so different <laughs> yeah. uh, um okay so but it is distinct these are different and apparently yeah. i need to know where each of them lay their eggs and when to actually know these things so um i did want to quickly before john you tell me about these ones uh peter johnson did join hi pete um glad of you glad you could join us um but he did point out lots of army cutworm in kansas this spring and i do remember uh hearing mm -hmm. about that as well that that the levels were incredibly high so this is uh, one of those pests that can at times just be in incredible uh, numbers as well. Um, Lara would like to know how you spell the term that you used, Scott, where they go to the the foothills and they hide estivation? in the rocks. Yes, estivation. A E S T I V. I don't know. Okay, estivation. Lara <laughs> yeah, got it right, and yeah. and and also you win for spelling bee. That that was an oh. impromptu spelling bee, and you totally win. <laughs> There well, you I go. just got the AES part. Probably. Yeah, the AES. <laughs> and that is, I have never heard that term before. It's my new favorite one. Um, so I'm going to write that down. Okay, we're running short on time, but John, there's a few things I wanted to cover. And both of them, well, I'll start with you, but Scott, of course, hop in. Um, two things. Do Who eats or preys on cutworms? And do flea beetles have any predators or parasitoid species let's start with cutworm what kills cutworms beyond me and my trowel because i do like to cut them in half but other than that <laughs> what what gets rid of cutworm for us cutting them cutting them in half is part of the what you're supposed to do when you find them because if they're green on the inside then they're feeding and if they're oh. not green on the inside they're they're actually probably molting so so i do it to make myself feel better but thank but you, Scott. Now I, but, but I sound now very you have smart. a justification. Yes. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Sorry, John, like go it. ahead. No. Yeah, John, go ahead. <laughs> I cut in on you. So, no, uh, actually, uh, I'm just going to follow up on Scott's point. Uh, sometimes when people uh, control cutworms, spray the field, they'll go up, they like to go out there the next day and make sure their spray worked and they'll find the odd live cutworm still and they'll be thinking the spray didn't work. Uh, when cutworms go through these molts, and they don't have the green stuff in their gut um, because they go through six stages and they have to shed their skin and they're not feeding for a few days when they uh, are going from stage to stage. So they're not going to be killed by the insecticide if they're going through a molt. So if you're finding a sizable proportion that aren't feeding, um, I guess my main point is uh, go back a couple more days and see Sometimes the spray doesn't get them all the first time, but the products we're using all have enough residual that after that second or third day, 
those molting cutworms will now be feeding and they'll be killed. So don't write off that you sprayed at work after day one. Um, back to your original question. Um, <laughs> what is, yeah, what, what kills is, them? Come on, there's yeah. got to be friends. So, um, so uh, as far as predators, uh, ground beetles probably top the list. And mm -hmm. ground beetles, they're an incredibly diverse group of beetles. We've got about 980 species roughly in Canada. So a hugely diverse group. Um, they're nocturnal predators. And I know everybody's seen these. When you turn over a clump of soil or a board or a stone or something, and you see these black, usually black or brown beetles scurry around. Those are often ground beetles. Um, we had a pet ground beetle we kept in our lab for uh, summer. And of course we were bringing... you did. <laughs> of course yeah, you we, did. Yeah. We were keeping, uh, we were feeding it mainly cutworms and white grubs. It was eating about seven or eight a day. Our summer students really had to work hard to keep it well fed. So they can be <laughs> great That's predators. Amazing. But there's also parasitoids, things that lay yes. eggs to the cutworms and mm -hmm. the young develop inside. And there's some really cool ones that will actually lay multiple eggs into the, um, the cutworms. Uh, there's a group called Cotesia that do that. And you'll just get this burst of like a hundred Cotesia larvae coming out of this uh, cutworm that they've parasitized. So uh, parasitoids can really make a dent in the population some years as well. Mm -hmm. We we see so that cool. with with the army cutworm we get in Alberta is we actually have a multi nucleate um, uh, parasitoid that lays a single egg, but it divides and divides and divides, and you actually literally literally end up with hundreds, and I think the record is like twenty five hundred little wasps that come out of a single cutworm, so from so from multi one egg multi nucleate, I think that's right. That word, too. John? Yeah. See, yeah. See, this, this, this is a vo vocabulary lesson. Today. This is yeah. This is what I'm learning tonight. You guys yeah. thought it was about insects. It's not. It's just so I can win yeah. a Jeopardy. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's it. Okay. So, which is fascinating, and this is the thing that um, if anyone sort of rolls their eyes at at insects, because I know lots of people that. Lots of farmers like iron or, you know, agronomists love scouting and soil testing, but the insect world is just so incredibly fascinating. And there are such cool things just like this. So um, I do appreciate being able to share some of these things. Um, John, quickly, there was a question about predators of flea beetles. So do we have any good ones that, that would take care of the crucifer or the striped for us or no? Mm, the word good is subjective. Uh, yeah. we, we know of things that eat them, whether they're good or not. Um, the difference with flea beetles, like a cutworm will, is slow and it's a really easy target for a ground beetle or um, rove beetles if they're small enough. The cutworms. Flea beetles are quick, small, not the same type of meal. So we know things like damsel bugs have been reported to feed on them, big eyed bugs. Uh, even certain species of ground beetles, uh, even field crickets have been recorded to have fed on flea beetles because they're omnivores, field crickets. Um, lacewing larvae, but again, I don't think they're a big part of any of their diet. It's more incidental. They happen to come across one on a cool enough day that it didn't jump away quick enough and they included it in their diet. Uh, so observationally, people have seen various um, predators eat flea beetles but I won't go as far as to say we have any good predators of flea beetles. And even with the parasitoids, we do have some parasitoids, but they're just not as effective as the ones that we see with uh, some of the cutworms. Some of these other ones. Okay. Yeah. I'm just, I'm somewhat disappointed. So if you guys could work on that, um, that would be great. <laughs> my spare so time, now we've yes. Yeah, in your in all of your spare time, if the two of you yes. could get to work on that. Um, yeah. Okay, so we've we've talked a bit about. Now this is just one hour, so of course we can't cover it all. But uh, Jason does ask. So we've talked wireworm, we've talked cutworm, we've talked flea beetles, which are perhaps the major ones. What other insects should early season only? Um, let's focus on early season for now. Are there any species that we've missed that we can maybe mention that agronomists should be on the lookout for? Hmm. I I'm think grasshoppers um, are a little later. So grasshoppers, yeah, grasshoppers really won't emerge in Alberta until late May and early June. So um, 
I, I think one thing we see in Southern Alberta on manured land is we do have a, a little uh, gr uh, grub. So um, uh, that does cause some damage. We see that often early in, in manured field. Um, but John, I'm, I'm drawing a blank, I'm sorry. But well, I'll throw two more into the mix. And one is alfalfa weevil. Mm -hmm. um, it, uh, it's been a pest in pockets in Manitoba, uh, especially the eastern and interlake part recently. Usually it, we start noticing it in June, but it's usually out even in late May. But June is when the larvae are doing their most feeding. It's the first, it's our first cut problem in alfalfa. So as we get go into June, uh, alfalfa weevil should be on your chart. And cycling back to grasshoppers, even though they are more of a later pest, we do encourage people to start your scouting in early June because mm -hmm. we do know that they have a very clumped distribution in the way they lay their eggs. And it's often on a field edge or a area right. outside of the field and areas that had a lot of lush green vegetation the previous season. If you can pick up that there is an incredibly high population concentrated ar around a field edge in June, and you do that spray, usually the good, a good timing for that spray is late June, very early July. The earlier you can pick up on those heavy populations and the earlier you can manage them, the uh, more successful you're going to be. Trying to deal with them later in the season when they've got their wings and they're moving around, it just doesn't work as well. So start your grasshopper scouting um, in June, even early June in some areas. And we have known people to even be spraying by mid-June for grasshoppers um, where, where they find these big patches coming up. Just don't spray too early uh, before you start to see wing buds because you're probably only uh, affecting a, a, a small proportion of the hatch. Right. Give them time to hatch out. I totally agree with John. I, I think notes taken in the fall where the grasshoppers are accumulating is really valuable. And I really encourage agronomists that have talked to me about grasshoppers to concentrate, like make notes where they're laying eggs, where, the, where they are in the fall. One I'd throw in that John helped spur me, uh, and I did check uh, peas today, is pea leaf weevil is active this time of year. And are really, yes. really good at finding early seeded peas. So we will start to see pea leaf weevil damage now, actually. The peas I saw today were coming second node and no pea leaf weevil yet. So all okay. good. So we could almost, I, I'm glad you brought it up because it's definitely one of the things um, that does come up, but another one that isn't necessarily super easy to control either, right? Right, yeah. That That's one we actually, concentrate on seed treatment to manage, not really control, but to manage. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. All right, and I do see, so Peter's got some questions here, and I'm sorry, Peter, we're not gonna have time to get to all of them. Um, I know that you're out planting, so I'm I'm sorry, we don't have time to get, we, he did wanna talk about seed corn maggot, um, which I don't know if either of you wanna talk to, although we did just before talk about a similar insect of carrot that is like a seed corn maggot. Um, uh, oh, and we lost John. John dropped so, off. Oh, John seed corn off, maggot. So is, yeah, yeah. yeah, seed corn maggot is uh, the only place we've seen seed corn maggot is in dry beans in uh, in Alberta. We don't really other otherwise have it as a problem. I know John did mention it, and um, I believe there's registrations for um, for seed treatments as well for seed corn maggot if if that's a per perennial problem. So mm -hmm. yeah. Yep. Um, all right. Okay. So we've already lost John. He must have, he just at, you know, nine Eastern, he turns into a pumpkin or something. It's, um, well, so, nine o'clock is beer time. So. Oh, it must be. Yeah. It's nine, yeah. well, it's nine yeah. Eastern. So there you go. All right. Yeah. Thank you so much, Scott. Thank you to everyone yeah. in the comments. Um, and yes, we'll have you on again. Uh, make sure you yeah. drink lots of water and make sure you get your snacks for all your scouting you've got to do tomorrow. And thank you to John. And thanks to everyone, of course, um, for joining us here on The Agronomist. We'll see you next week, 8 p.m. Eastern. All right. Cheers, everybody. Yeah. Bye.